Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another live stream of History Valley Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Professor Lawrence Schiffman, and we're going to be discussing his book that he co-authored. And here it is right here. The World's Greatest Book, The Story of How the Bible Came to Be. And he co-authored the book with Jerry Pattengale. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And for those that want to purchase the book, the link to it, is in the description below this video. It's going to be right at the top of the description, so you can't miss it. With that being said, welcome back to the show, Lawrence. Thank you. All right, let's get right into it. It is believed, not by all, but by many, especially um, uh, those that venerate and follow the, the teachings in the, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, that Moses composed all five books of the Torah, although it appears to not have always been believed that he was the author. And today, uh, many scholars, as you know, question if the, the, the validity of the claim that he actually wrote all five books of the, of the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. And they come up with uh, the documentary hypothesis, which we'll go through in the next slide. But before I get way too far into that. Um, what, are, what is your thoughts about all this? Look, I think it's a very, very complicated problem, obviously. And we can look at it, we can look at it from two points of view. One point of view is a kind of personal religious point of view. And one can come to a conclusion that the uh, five books of Moses, which is called the Torah, is totally a result of divine revelation. And one doesn't necessarily have to believe that Moses was the author of that. Well, one can believe more in a traditional point of view that uh, Moses actually received all of his revelation, recorded it by writing it down in this manner. And, uh, of course, as we all know, there are many people who think that it was composed by humans, and they basically fall into two categories somehow or another. One category that, that seems to think that uh, the Bible still should be at the core of guidance for our lives, and the other that doesn't. I think one of the biggest problems that we have today is that we look at this in an oversimplified way. That is to say, people think somehow or another that uh, God will literally speak to a person, and this person will literally get God's word, like we're talking Lawrence, now. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but um, the audience is saying that they're having a hard time hearing you. No, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it might have been some related to the microphone problem we had before the show. Um, could you repeat that again, if you don't mind? No, I hope it will be hearing it now. I'm speaking from a little bit closer to the microphone. So at any rate, what I want to say is that there are a number of ways of looking at this question. There are those who see the entire Bible to Moses as a result of divine revelation, even if they don't necessarily believe that it was all through some direct speech to Moses in some uh, way in which we would be speaking one to another. And then there are others who actually would take this more literally and feel that there uh, is an actual set of words that's being spoken by God and being heard by Moses. And finally, it seems that of those who don't necessarily believe that God revealed himself directly in any way, many of them still seem to think that the five books of Moses and the Bible in general should be a guide for our lives. I think when you look at all these points of view, you realize that somehow or another we have to come away and say, we don't really understand how God would reveal himself to humanity. And therefore, to a great extent, much of this debate is debate about something that we will never know, we will never understand, and never be able to prove, or not be able to prove. And I think at some point it becomes a matter of religious faith as to whether what we really believe about this difficult, these types of questions. But uh, I think, of course, most of us would probably say that it's obviously a good thing that many people, even if they question the divine revelation, still find wisdom in the book because our basic moral code is based on the five books of Moses. The audience is still complaining that they're having a hard time hearing you. Um, can you check these settings and the stream? Yeah, that's what to do before. I was happy to do that. There, maybe the wrong microphone is selected. Not, it's not, not impossible. Uh, hmm. Here we go, sound. This is it's a completely new system. Yeah. 
and uh, select real tech audio. It's probably right. It's on the maximum volume. There's a mono, which I don't think it's doing us any good. Uh, here we go. It's probably the wrong microphone is selected. How about this now? It's much better? Yeah, that's much better. Okay, so as this is there we go. Look this that the camera that was put on here, which bears the microphone, was only used once before this meeting today. So I have to apologize to everybody that that was the case. And uh, a funny fact happened for those who are interested in computer funny things happen. I got a new system, and the new system has two screens, which I always like to use. Turns out it had no microphone because it had no camera. It's hard to believe anybody marked into the computer without a camera. But if they can hear now, then we're in business. Yeah, it's a, it's only a little bit better. Really? But yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. Um, is it using a built-in microphone? No, it's using a, a microphone, which is in, I think, which is in the camera. Uh, the camera? Hmm. I'll go back over here to sound. This, okay, that's the speaker. They don't care about the microphone. Yeah, it's in the webcam, right? Now, they, I try to see if, device. I don't have a device. Try right. to see if it'll let you select a different microphone. Well, what kind of device you want to add? No, because he's got the only one that it's got. Yeah, try the other one. That was the one we had before. Okay. So we're going back to the first one. Here we go. Yeah, I hear you a little bit better if you stay close to the screen. Which microphone? This one or the, this one? Or this one here? Yeah, I hear you okay on this one. Well, you're probably just going to have to stay right next to the screen. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, no, it's no, pro it's no problem. These things happen. Okay, so it is believed by many uh, many Hebrew Bible scholars that four major traditions, four major documents, or um, were involved in the composition, the long term composition of the Torah or Pentateuch. Um, I mean, the Yahweh's Elohim's priestly and redactor sources. I know that there are different theories, like the supplementary hypothesis and other different hypotheses um, to explain the composition of the text. Um, what do you make of this? Do you think that the documentary hypothesis does explain it, or do you think it could, might be too hypothetical? Because I know that not all scholars. Yeah, subscribe. look, I think that there are several questions here. First of all, the documentary hypothesis does start with a generally correct uh, observation that there are different literary styles in the material that's in the Torah. Now, generally, the way it's presented to us, the style of the narratives of Genesis, which are what be, would be said by documentary hypothesis advocates to be made up of J and E. These, uh, this, air, this material presents a certain type of narrative style. And then we have in uh, the Leviticus, essentially, in some related materials, a style which gives us a series of sacrificial procedures and requirements. And then we have the Deuteronomic style, which uh, is a kind of combination of those form of a legal style, along with a type of uh, auditory style. And there's no question that there are different literary styles. Now, a person who believes that God gave the Torah can simply believe that all these styles could be authored by a divine author, or could be given by a divine author. But of course, modern scholars have used this as the basis for dividing up strands. Now, here's where the problem comes, because the strands are not really convincing to most people. In fact, today, gradually more and more scholars are thinking that the, the theory of the strands is too simplistic. And there is a migration among many scholars to a point of view of a longer period of a kind of accretion of materials. Now, however one sees that, uh, it, it becomes, I think, pretty clear that if they, in order to make the documentary hypothesis work, you have to move over the place, chop up material, and this half of the verse comes from here, this half of the verse comes from there, this half comes from there. 
it assumes a process of editing, which is way they call it redacting, is way too complex to very likely have happened. And I think that's the problem with that theory. Whereas the theory about accretions or material coming together is not actually even all that far away from the traditional point of view in which you have a revelation taking place over an entire long period of time, which is described by the, the Torah itself. So in, in any way, I think that the as it's normally stated, the documentary hypothesis, irrespective of the religious side of the debate, do not really solve the problems because it requires too much of this kind of uh, cutting up of materials that you see on the slides right here, what it's talking about and how that would have actually happened. I think the much more significant aspect of the documentary hypothesis that people sort of ignore is that it proposes a theory of the history of Israelite religion. And this theory of the history of Israelite religion is designed from the point of view of Protestantism because it's a system in which if you look at the dates of the materials, you see that the sacrificial material is made last. And in a certain sense, there is an attempt to see the sacrificial material as a, an almost post-prophetic going astray and not as a core of divine revelation and of, of God's will. So a lot of uh, Jewish and Protestant scholars have big problems. Jewish, I'm sorry, and Catholic scholars have had big problems with the documentary hypothesis that it stands which is why the Israeli scholar, Hezkel Kaufman, who was very popular for a while, I will say he's much less popular now, but Hezkel Kaufman had put together the notion that the order of the text as proposed by the documentary hypothesis should be changed in order to allow the ritual material to come at a much earlier date, part of the form of Israelite religion. And uh, this is a Protestant, more or less it's a Protestant to argue that these types of rituals are a late moving away from the true prophetic religion. How does the Dead Sea Scrolls help us really determine, like, let me put it this way, how does it help, how, how does the Dead Sea Scrolls help us understand the origins of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, in terms of the manuscript family tree? Well, in some sense, it doesn't. Let me explain why. The earliest Dead Sea Scrolls come from 225 BCE, approximately. So if I want to know what the Torah and the other books of the prophets and the writings were like at the time when the, uh, these manuscripts were written, I have a tremendous insight as to what the Bible was like at that time. But that doesn't tell me anything about the composition of Jeremiah or the composition of Isaiah. And all these questions about whether there were multiple authors in the Torah, there were multiple authors in Isaiah, all these books are presented to us by this time as complete books, and all the materials are essentially in their current unified form. So uh, that's the case. Now, it is true that Nancy Scrolls do tell us about the state of the Bible at that time, and that the state of the Bible Bible at that time, at least was represented in those manuscripts, was less stable than one would have expected and less stable than it was several hundred years later. Because several hundred years later, the continental text is already completely stable. So it gives us an eye into a period which is after the composition and editing of the material, but in which the material is not totally stable on its textual basis. So basically, you're saying that the, the, the these books cannot be substantiated to have been multi-authored, as a lot of these scholars are saying. By um, any of these later manuscripts. Because, but it's really like saying the following. There's a lot of discussion whether Shakespeare wrote all of Shakespeare. But we today have a whole bunch of Shakespearean plays that say on the top that by William Shakespeare. Now, they're not going to help us to know if uh, he copied a poem from someone else or if somebody stuck one in by accident, or if one of the plays wasn't written by him. So do you think that a single person wrote 
the first five books of the Torah? Or well, do you think very one is written by a different person? I don't think that, actually, that's a funny question, the way you put it. And the reason mm -hmm. is this. Because the Jewish point of view is that it's a result of divine revelation. So mm -hmm. the person who wrote it, in a certain sense, didn't compose it. Now, if you ask the question whether a single human being composed the text, so I would say no. And, 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 and that's because I don't believe that it is really the result of a regular human composition. And furthermore, besides that, if it were, the documentary hypothesis would be correct in observing the different styles and not being able to believe that one human being would have written in all those different styles. I think now we're shifting uh, to the New Testament. Um, and let's start with Paul, Peter, and James, who are on the screen here. Um, they seem, I know that most scholars seem to put uh, Paul's letters, either some will even put them in the 40s or some will put them in the 50s. Um, do you put them specifically generally in the 50s of the season? Well, I would say more or less yes, but okay. I don't know if we can be so sure what is the difference between 58 and 62. I think we have mm. to be a little bit careful about some of this, right? And then furthermore, of course, we all know that the Deuteronomy Pauline uh, epistles were themselves composed later, and we the evidence, the earliest evidence we have for these texts is still a little bit later. So we have to be careful about how exactly we are making these claims. Mm. Some scholars think that Paul, in, in his uh, authentic letters, appears to be reusing ideas or theological uh, thought processes coming from the Dead Sea Scroll theology. Um, do you think uh, that is correct? I think it's a bit, let's put it this way, it's a bit of an overstatement. We have to step back for a minute and ask the question about the effect of the Dead Sea Scrolls on the New Testament in general. Because what happens with the New Testament is, it derives from a general kind of climate of ideas, which is very different from somebody using the scroll directly. Now, there's no evidence at all that any New Testament work actually was using the Dead Sea Scroll directly, except we might say, although we don't know whether they were using the Dead Sea version or some other language, but the Enoch quotation in Jude, that is the only direct quotation of a work that is known from these texts. So what we really are talking about is the extent to which a writer might be influenced by ideas that are found in the scrolls, which that writer could have gotten from any one of a number of sort of, uh, let's call them paths through which this information was circulated. So we can take as an example, the idea of the uh, human being being made up of the soul and the physical body, and the idea that the physical body tends to bring the person to sin, whereas the soul is the divine uh, aspect that would be regarded as, as the goodness of the human being, as opposed to the body, which is trying to get the, the soul all the time to go down the wrong path. Now, that kind of a point of view can be supported in various Dead Sea Scroll texts, especially in a group of texts that we call Thanksgiving Scroll. Now, the problem is, did Paul get that idea from either those texts or from the Hellenistic world in general, in which such a concept was abroad, or did he get it in a, some kind of an indirect manner from the general intellectual or religious atmosphere in which he was operating? And that's where the crucial question that we can never answer, I think, comes. So you really can't say that because Paul has an idea like that, and it's so significant that it actually comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Would you what say that the Deutero-Pauline epistles were probably written after 70, after the Second after the Second Temple was destroyed, just like the four Gospels were? Yeah, I think that's most probably the case, but there's a very important thing about the Gospels. The Gospels are what you might call the most Jewish knowing part of the New Testament. The Gospels know all kinds of things about Jewish rituals and practices and about life in the land of Israel. 
So it's apparent that the documents that underlie the Gospels go back much earlier. They are probably, in my view, the earliest New Testament material, despite the fact that everyone is always saying Pauline epistles are the earliest. Now, I'm not saying the Gospels, by the way. Again, I'm saying the source material that underlies the Gospels. Is that what we're talking about, like the four document hypothesis, Q, M, and L? Well, it doesn't matter in a certain sense which uh, hypothesis one takes. It seems to be that virtually everyone agrees that there is material that underlies the gospel, whether we see the Q document or the other document, or whether we are talking about so-called low boy things, words uh, attributed to Jesus, or a variety of stories that may have circulated separately before we put together. Whichever variety you take, it seems that the source material describing Jesus' life in Judea and Galilee is material which must be earlier than the uh, epistles themselves, even before. It's only the finished books of the Gospels that post-date Paul's epistles. Now, just like with the documentary hypothesis, scholars think that the some scholars think that the four Gospels were written in stages have been compiled at the end do you like you uh do you like you did earlier with the torah um also disagree with them when it comes to the gospels being written in stages well the question is not whether they were written in stages in a certain sense because it's clear that they have source material which was put in to create the final gospel and some of the source material is shared by one or more gospel so once you have that, it does appear that they were this material somehow got distributed into these different accounts, which overlay it in their own way. Each of them are overlaying it in, in, in its own way. So it seems to me that some such theory has to be true. I think that the, the fundamental difference between the, the problems regarding the Torah and the Gospels is that those who believe in the Gospels don't claim that the Gospel text itself is somehow or another revealed. And of course, they, they, the differences between the Gospels are well known, and the need to harmonize them in religious teaching is well known. Whereas, of course, in the case of the, the difference here is that Judaism understood the Torah as being one entity. And that seems to be the central belief of Judaism, somehow or another, understand the Torah as a unity. Whereas in the case of the, of the, the Gospels, the need to understand their contradictions and to harmonize them somehow or another was understood all along. That is also the case with the Torah, but the difference is that in the case with the Torah, it was still assumed to have come from one author of the rest. Of course, by the way, the, the people whose names appear on these books are not necessarily the authors of the Gospels, but that's another matter. Does Marcion... Um who's coming in after pretty much after the new testament's uh completely written down maybe even in the form it exists now um but uh does marcion seem to be trying to um take his views from earlier people that because it, marcion thinks that the uh the jewish god is the devil and that jesus came from a different god he's the son of a different god and he seems to be Using text like the Gospel of John, perhaps, and reinterpreting it when it says things that it says, like in John chapter eight about um, of Jews being the sons of the devil, or something like something like that. What do you think about all that? No, I think that Marcion is coming with a kind of Gnostic idea, and that Gnostic idea sees the original Creator God as an evil God, and the true God is some higher entity, and in the case of Marcion, this becomes even more significant because he presents a Christianity that wants to negate the Hebrew Bible, which is, of course, quoted by the, the Christians as the Old Testament. So in a certain sense, it's a form also of an anti-Semitic point of view, because it basically is arguing that the part of Judaism needs to be removed from Christianity to obtain pure Christianity. And the thing which the Jews had developed is all evil, and as a result of that evil God, that troublemaking danger, and has to be uh, 
removed and deleted, and only the New Testament would therefore be valid. Now, this is kind of hard to understand how you can do this because so much of the New Testament is dependent on Hebrew scriptures, but at any rate, that was his point of view. And it is an early influence of the Gnostic approach, which later on is found in all these Gnostic gospels that every once in a while someone wants to claim was an original gospel. And it looks like that the development of the New Testament uh, manuscript family tree is kind of uh, reminiscent of the Old Testament. Um, oh, yeah, that's sure, because much of the stuff went the same way. Because remember, that with the exception of the Hebrew text, once the uh, Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, so you have a kind of Christian dissemination. And that complex Christian dissemination runs along with the New Testament dissemination because they're being disseminated together. And the separate dissemination of the Jews is not on obviously not on this testament chart, but, but it was, was barely on the chart that we saw before. Whereas the, the Jewish dissemination would be a, something of a different story. But the Christian dissemination with both testaments as the Christians understand them together and as them disseminated together, often in the same codex. And uh, that is the end of the slide right there. And so basically, when you take a look at the, the New Testament and you look at the Septuagint, and you look at the Hebrew Bible and the lens of the, with the, with the lens of the Dead Sea Scrolls, because I've noticed some scholars point out that the Gospel of Matthew, when it talks about the Isaiah, uh, chapter 7 prophecy uh, that it's reinterpreting to to suggest that Jesus had a virgin birth because look, you see that prophecy there it's foretelling the virgin birth of Jesus but it seems to be using the Septuagint the Septuagint's version of that text not the Hebrew Bible's version because it's quoting that because the Hebrew Bible's version doesn't say that um, Emmanuel would be the son of a virgin does it seem to be doing that a lot when you look at the New Testament? Well, the New Testament, and Josephus did this too, generally uses the Septuagint all over because they don't want to translate the Bible again into Greek. So what they do is from all their quotations, they simply take the material right out of the Septuagint, the Greek translation, and they quote it. Now, the problem is a little bit more complex for the following reason. Sometimes the New Testament contains quotations that have either been purposely or accidentally changed from the original. In the purposeful ones, the New Testament commentators have pointed out all over the place that these are intentional changes made in order for a certain message to be given over. However, in some other ones, it seems not to be a result of that. But some of these types of textual variants appear to be similar than textual variants that we would observe in manuscripts from the Dead Sea Scroll or in between the Septuagint and the Hebrew text. So there's two phenomena going on at once. One is the use of the text for a specific homiletical and religious, or as it's called in, in New Testament terms, charismatic purpose, while at the same time you have the, the normal fact of certain types of textual variants that could creep in at the time. But at any rate, the uh, use of the Septuagint was a great convenience to somebody writing a book in, in Greek. Why should he translate the Bible again? It just takes the Septuagint. I think uh, we can stop there. We've have uh, we've had no questions from the audience so far, so I just want to say I thank everybody for watching the stream, and I apologize for the audio difficulties earlier. Um, that being said, thanks for joining me today, Lawrence. Thank you. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.